G'day, this is Chris Savage from RL Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the book of Jeremiah. I pray that it will be of benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. So thank you for coming along. We're now into session 33. We're going to be looking at chapter 50, uh, verse 1 to 34. That's our hope. We'll, we'll cover that today. Now, we're into looking at Babylon. Now, this whole section is in Babylon. The discussion that we're going to see in Jeremiah 50 and 51 will, is going to show us that the, the viewpoint of the prophecies concerning Babylon differs greatly from that of previous prophecies. Okay, Previously, uh, Jeremiah had seen the throne of Babylon as being mighty. He was able to overthrow the kingdom of Judah. However, in this section moving forward, what we're going to do is we're going to see Jeremiah now sees Babylon as, as, tot as tottering and weak. It's about to be overthrown by others. And the tone of, of this prophecy is, is quite vindictive and uh, passionate against Babylon. Now, some of his main pre predications are repeated here, or predictions, predications, uh, having a seniors moment. Some of his main <laughs> predictions are repeated. For instance, four different times he mentions that the main attack is from the north. Now, that's in, in Jeremiah 50, verse 3, and verse 9, and verse 41, and verse 48. Eleven times he mentions an assault against Babylon. Nine times he mentions a destruction upon Babylon, and there's going to be other repetitions as well. Chapter 50 to 51 now make a very fitting conclusion to Jeremiah's prophecies. Uh, the book begins with Babylon's might, and it now ends with Babylon's demise. Now, elsewhere, uh, Babylon is dealt with by the prophets. For instance, Isaiah 13, 1 to Isaiah 14, 23, Isaiah 21, verse 1 and verse 10, uh, Isaiah, uh, sorry, Isaiah, yeah, Isaiah 46, 1 to 47, 15, and the last book of the Bible, Revelation 18, 1 to 24. These all deal with, with uh, Babylon. The prophecies that deal with, with the Babylon of history which is past, were fulfilled when the Persians took over the empire. That's uh, under Cyrus. So these prophecies are found in Isaiah 21, verses 1 to 10, and Isaiah 46, verse 1 to 47, verse 15. Now, when dealing with uh, Babylon in the scriptures, we need it's necessary for us to be able to distinguish between uh, those that deal with the Babylon of history and those that deal with the Babylon of the future. The Babylon of the future will be a rebuilt city. It's going to be built on the same site where Babylon once stood. It'll be built on the banks of the Euphrates River in modern-day Iraq. It's going to become, in the future, Babylon will become the world political and economic capital of the Antichrist. And from this city, the Antichrist will rule the world politically and economically. And eventually, Babylon will suffer a very sudden, quick, and massive destruction as part of the campaign of Armageddon. But the prophecies that deal with the destruction of Babylon of the future, we see, in, first of all, in Isaiah uh, chapter 13, verse 1, to chapter 14, verse 23, and what we're going to see here in Jeremiah chapters 50 and 51, and also uh, again down in Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 to 24. Now, there's a simple principle that helps in determining uh, the uh, level of prophecy of each passage. If the prophecies have never been fulfilled in history, well, then they concern the prophetic future. So that's how we're going to look at this as we go through this, this, these next, this next study. Now, what's the topic? It's a topic in, in chapter 50, verse 1. It's the word that Jehovah spake concerning Babylon, concerning the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. So Jehovah spoke this word concerning Babylon and the land of Chaldeans. The Babylonians, who were they? Well, the Babylonians were descendants of a semi-nomadic tribe known as the Kaldu, K-L-D-U, and from the Kaldu tribe came the name of Chaldeans. Jeremiah will speak uh, both of Babylon and of the Chaldeans. They're interchangeable. Um, now, the means of this prophecy here was through the prophet Jeremiah. And now in verses 2 to 10, we're going to see Babylon's fall and Israel's deliverance. 
In verses 2 to 3, we see the destruction of Babylon is now proclaimed. In verse 2, we see the failure of, of the Babylonian gods. Uh, it, here it's spelled out. He begins now with a declaration. Declare ye among the nations and publish and set up a standard. Publish and conceal not. Now, we see five elements to this prophetic proclamation regarding Babylon. First of all, <coughs> Babylon is taken, uh, meaning the city herself will be captured. Second, Bel is put to shame. Now, the name Bel is derived from the Semitic word Baal, meaning Lord. Uh, Bel was the Akkadian counterpart of the Sumerian deity called Enlil. This is a bit of, bit of false god history for you. Bel was the Babylonian storm god. He was also the god of agriculture who separated heaven and earth to make room for plants to grow. Yeah, I bet you didn't know that. Now, third, we had Merodach. Merodach is dismayed. This is another name. Another name for this god is Marduk. Marduk, uh, he was a chief god of the city of Babylon and the head of the Babylonian pantheon. Um, fourth, it says her images are put to shame. Yeah. Since these gods uh, will be unable to protect and save the city of Babylon, they'll become a reproach and a laughing stock. And, and then fifth, it says her idols are dismayed. Now, Jeremiah shows what he believes these idols are actually worth. These idol gods are something like <laughs> the, 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 the shameful balls of excrement, this is Jeremiah, or compost. Um, he uses the word here for images and idols. It's that word gilolim. Uh, it, it refers here to representations of the deities in statue form. And the word gilolim is indelicate. It means balls of excrement. Poop. Now, in verse 3, he now deals with an attack. For out of the north, there comes up a nation against her, which shall make her land desolate, and none shall dwell therein. They are fled, they are gone, both man and beast. Now, out of the north, a nation comes against Babylon. So this is another place here, which shows that this was not a fulfillment of prophecy, okay? Why? Who is the next conquering nation, uh, empire? The Persians, the Persians came from the east many years ago. This attack now comes from the north. The emphasis here is upon one nation. So this verse here is the first indication that chapters 50 and 51 describe the destruction of the future city of, of Babylon. Now, throughout prophecy, throughout this prophecy of Jeremiah, there is a constant play between one nation and many nations. There'll be one army, many armies. The, what's the point? Well, the point is that many armies comes against Babylon, but one army or one nation takes the lead. And, and by this point, the emphasis is upon one nation, and this one nation will make Babylon's land desolate. Again, Cyrus which was the, the, the Medo-Persian Empire's king, uh, did not fulfill this. He did not make the land of Babylon desolate. Quite the opposite. He rather subjugated Babylon to benefit from its rich earth along the banks of the Euphrates River. The results of this judgment here shall be that one, that will be that no one will deliver. Neither man nor beast shall dwell within Babylon after this happens. Again, None of this occurred under Cyrus. <clears throat> Babylon remained intact and it was populated for several centuries afterwards. Babylon will be destroyed as part of the second stage of the campaign of Armageddon. So, on the one hand, uh, he announces the destruction of Babylon, but then on the, on the flip side, on the other hand, he announces the restoration of Israel. Israel's final restoration for the millennial kingdom will come in conjunction with the destruction of Babylon. Babylon, as we said, is going to be destroyed as part of the second stage of the, of the campaign of Armageddon. By the time that all stages of the campaign of Armageddon have run their course, 
the Messiah Jesus will have returned and set up his kingdom, which will bring Israel's final restoration. Uh, and this restoration we're going to see in verses 4 to 8. In verses 4 to 5, he now talks about the return of Israel. First part of verse 4 is the timing of this final return. <clears throat> in those days and in that time, says Jehovah. Now, what's this saying to us? This is placing this in the prophetic future. In those days and in that time. At the time, when at the time, at the time of the final destruction, at the time of the final fall of Babylon, the closing days of the tribulation will also mark the time of Israel's final restoration. Second part of verse four, he describes Israel's regeneration. The children of Israel and, and Judah, it says they shall go their way weeping. They shall seek Jehovah their God. So they're going to seek the Lord, and those who seek him shall indeed find him. Uh, we see that in, in Psalm chapter 9, verse Psalm 9, not chapter 9, Psalm 9, verse 10, Psalm 34, verse 4, and also back in Jeremiah 29, 13. So the verse here shows that all of Israel, meaning all 12 tribes, will seek Jehovah at that time. And in verse Verse 5 describes their Zionism. Uh, they shall inquire concerning Zion with their faces thitherward, saying, Come ye and join yourselves to Jehovah in an everlasting covenant that shall not be forgotten. Now, not only will the people of Israel and Judah seek the Lord, but also they're going to inquire concerning Zion with their faces set toward the land of Israel. They will call on their fellow Jews to join themselves unto Jehovah with an everlasting covenant that will not be forgotten. Now, which covenant is this that won't be forgotten? Well, this everlasting covenant of, Jer of Jeremiah 50 verse 5 is the new covenant of Jeremiah 31 verse 31 to 34. One of the byproducts of this new covenant will be the salvation of every single Jew living at that time now just a, a little bit of little verse here and what is zionism in regarding zionism we, we have two false views here the first view is that zionism is some sort of racism and racial discrimination and so uh, what people what people do is by condemning zionism's right to exist one condemns israel's right to exist for it is impossible to separate Zionism from Israel. That's the first view. The second view is that Zionism is some form of worldwide Jewish conspiracy to undermine Western culture in order to allow for a communist takeover. That is another one of these views on Zionism. Now, both of those are false. So if Zionism is neither a conspiracy to control the world or racism, well, what actually is Zionism? Well, Biblically, Zionism is concerned with the land of Zion and with its capital, Jerusalem. Zionism actually describes a feeling. It's an expression of the yearning of that God himself has placed in the heart of every Jewish person. Unfulfilled Zionism is, being, is living outside the land of Israel. Fulfilled Zionism is being in and living in the land. So it's an expression of the longing and yearning that the Jewish people have had in the past, and they actually still have for their homeland, Israel. Zionism actually existed during the Egyptian bondage. It existed during the Babylonian captivity. It exists in these days of the, the, the diaspora that began right back in AD 70. As soon as a Jew expresses a desire to go back to his land, regardless of his reason, He's expressing Zionism. Any Jew who looks toward and identifies himself with the promised land, whether he knows it or not, whether he admits it or not, is actually a Zionist. Uh, typical Zionist passages of scripture are Psalm 137 verses 1 to 6, Psalm 137, 1 to 6, and Isaiah 62 verse 1. Isaiah 62 verse 1. Okay, let's get back on to uh, the topic here. Now, 
The condition of Israel as, as a saved nation is now contrasted in verses six to seven with her past condition. Now, uh, in the past, their condition was lost. They're lost. Remember, we're looking at Israel as a saved nation in the future. It's so looking backwards. In the past, their condition was lost. Their lostness is now described in verse six. It, it says here, my people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. Now, just like other prophets, Jeremiah clearly pinned the blame for the waywardness of Israel on the religious leaders. They were the ones who led God's people astray, causing dispersion and aimless wanderings. Such was Israel's condition in the past, and it stands in stark contrast to what's going to happen in the future. Now, verse 7 makes the point that throughout their history, uh, the Jewish people were always prey. All that have found them have devoured them. And their adversaries said, we are not guilty because they have sinned against Jehovah, the habitation of righteousness, even Jehovah, the hope of their fathers. Now, what's this talking about here? Well, what this is saying here is that their adversaries, the Jewish, the adversaries of the Jews have caught them and devoured them. So after having caught them and devoured them, their adversaries then claim innocence. I said, well, it's not our fault. Notice this verse very carefully here. This verse describes what has been true for, for millennia. Often when Israel's enemies persecuted the Jewish people, they declared their own innocence by claiming that the Jews had brought this calamity upon themselves by forgetting their God. In other words, they used Jewish unbelief as an excuse for persecuting God's chosen people. People are persecuting the Jews and having persecuted the Jews, having hated the Jews, having killed the Jews, they then proceed to say that they're not guilty. We're not guilty. Jews have been called Christ killers. And, it, and this is a, a good example here that Gentiles fulfill this verse when they try to cover up their own anti-Semitism by saying, well, the Jews killed the Messiah, and therefore it's acceptable for us to persecute the Jews. It's a good example here of fulfilling verse 7, but this is not of divine sanction. Okay? Uh, these verses make that very clear. No one who persecutes the Jews can use Jewish unbelief as a reason for doing so. God will hold those who persecute the Jews responsible. This excuse will not be held in high esteem by God. The fact of Jewish unbelief never gives the Gentiles a free reign to persecute the Jews. The fact of Jewish unbelief, I'll tell you again, never gives Gentiles a free reign to persecute the Jews. God will not hold anyone guiltless who has animosity against his Jewish people. Verse 8 there's a call to the Jews to flee Babylon prior to its final destruction. Flee out of the midst of Babylon and go forth out of the land of the Chaldeans and be as the he-goats before the flocks. Now, the he-goat, what's the he-goat? Well, the he-goat or the ram was the leader of the flock. He was the example to the others. Where he went, the others would follow. There's a call here to the Jews to become he-goats or leaders and what are they going to do? Other non-Babylonian nations would follow them out of the city of Babylon. So this call to the Jews to leave Babylon just before her destruction is repeated elsewhere in the scripture. In Isaiah 48, verse 20. Isaiah 48, 20 says, Go ye forth from Babylon, flee from the Chaldeans, with a voice of singing declare thee, tell, tell this, utter it even to the end of the earth. Say ye, Jehovah has redeemed his servant, Jacob. Another passage is Revelation 18, verses 4 to 5. Uh, it says, I heard a voice from heaven saying, Come forth, my people, out of her, out of Babylon. And you have no fellowship with her sins, and you receive not of her plagues. Okay, now, verses 9 to 10, he deals with the destruction of Babylon. He makes two important points here concerning the destruction. 
First of all, it's going to be accomplished by a company of great nations. Verse 9. For lo, I will stir up and cause to come up against Babylon a company of great nations from the north country. Babylon's destruction is God's work. Based upon what was said in verse 7, the Babylonians may hold themselves guiltless for what they did to the Jews, but God will hold them guilty. The Babylonians believed that the Jews had it coming to them because of their unbelief. Nevertheless, God will destroy the Babylonians and save the Jews. Yeah, unlike what we saw back in verse 3, the emphasis here is not on one nation, but on many nations. They'll come from the north to draw up their battle lines against Babylon. The attack itself will come from the north, and they shall set themselves in array against her, that's Babylon. From thence she shall be taken, their arrows shall be as of an expert mighty man, none shall return in vain. So again, going from the north. Second, the result is that Babylon will become a prey. Remember, verse 10 says this, and Chaldea shall be a prey. All that prey upon her shall be satisfied, says Jehovah. Now, back in verse 7, the Jewish people were seen as prey, but now it's Babylon's turn. All those will, who will plunder her will have a nice share in the spoil. Uh, and here we have that, remember, of Genesis 12, verse 3. This, is punish, this punishment here is another example of the biblical principle of curse for curse in kind. Babylon made the Jews a prey. Now God will make Babylon a prey. Now we see the desolation of Babylon in verses 11 to 16. And this, this was the cause of Babylon's desolation. And it also declares a judgment that could not be averted. Passage begins in verse 11 with the description of the sinful way in which Babylon will treat the Jewish people during the tribulation. The sin itself is described in verse 11. Because you are glad, because you rejoice, O ye that plunder my heritage. Notice the term, my heritage. The heritage of God is Israel. You can see that in Deuteronomy 32, verse 9. Babylon has plundered God's heritage. She has plundered Israel. And in light of doing that, she has become wanton as a heifer that treadeth out the grain and nay as strong horses. So what this is saying is that she bellows like a heifer or a bull lusting after grain. She lusts after possessions. This is what Babylon did in defeating Jerusalem. Then in verse 12, the punishment comes. Your mother shall be utterly put to shame. She that bear you shall be confounded. Behold, she shall be the hindermost, part, hindermost of the nations, a wilderness, a dry land, and a desert. So Babylon is now going to become the least of the nations. She'll be a wilderness, a dry land, and a desert. Now, the Talmud <clears throat> teaches that anyone who passes a grave of a Gentile is to recite, Your mother shall be sore ashamed. She who bore you shall be confounded. Behold, the hindermost of the nations shall be a wilderness, a dry land, and a desert. This is what the Talmud says regarding uh, Jeremiah 50, verse 12. Uh, and the reason for this Talmudic command is that it, it means that a nation whose character is, is bestial is both a disgrace and a disappointment to mankind, whether in life or in death. Yeah, the second, uh, the second key reason we're going to see here is that Babylon is going to suffer the wrath of Jehovah in verse 13. Because of the wrath of Jehovah, <clears throat> she shall not be inhabited. But she shall be wholly desolate. Everyone that goes by Babylon shall be astonished and hiss at all her plagues. Uh, back in verse 7, Jehovah had declared that Babylon will be punished for her mistreatment to the Jewish people. Now he added that the other cause would be his own wrath. And the result, she's going to be desolated because of her treatment to the Jews and because she'll suffer the wrath of Jehovah. Isaiah uh, chapter 13, verse 20, has this to say regarding Babylon of the future. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall shepherds 
make their flocks to lie down there. It's going to be completely desolate. In verses 14 to 16, Jeremiah now gives the cause for Babylon's destruction. The cause is enemy nations. And in this section, three commands are issued to the enemies against the Babylonians. First of all, in verse 14, set yourselves in array against Babylon all around. All you who bend the bow, shoot at her, spare no arrows. So military men of foreign nations are now told to set themselves in array against her. They're not to hold back when attacking the city. And this merciless assault will be justified because Babylon, why, has sinned against Jehovah. And her sin involved idolatry and the mistreatment of the Jewish people. So the second thing, the second thing, second cause, a shout against her round about, verse 15 tells, shout against her round about, she has submitted herself. Her bulwarks are fallen, her walls are thrown down, for it is the vengeance of Jehovah. Take vengeance upon her as she has done, do unto her. So Babylon's enemies are now to raise a shout of a military commander ready to attack the target. And they are not to let up until the city falls and is in total submission. And in that way, she will suffer Jehovah's vengeance. Now, Revelation 18, verse 6, picks up the, um, the, the latter statement here of verse 15, namely that Babylon's enemies are to do to her what she has done to others. This is uh, uh, Revelation 18, verse 6. Render unto her even as she rendered, double unto her the double according to her works. In the cup which she mingled, mingle unto her double. So uh, Babylon in the future will actually get double what she gave out. Now, the third thing we see here is in verse 16, cut off the sower from Babylon and him that handles a sickle in the time of harvest. So this command here has to do with the destruction of, of the citizenship who are responsible for producing the food sources for this city. For fear of the oppressing sword, this is those people, uh, they shall turn everyone to his people and they shall flee everyone to his own land. So, just as was prophesied earlier in verse 8, the Jewish people will be the first ones to flee from Babylon. They'll become like the he-goat that leads the flocks out of their enclosures, and they'll be like the leaders who others will follow as they flee Babylon. And the passage here ends with a statement that other non-Babylonian nationals, these are the, the, uh, the, the other peoples, um, they will also forsake Babylon and return to their own lands because Babylon has lost all value to them. There's no more point in staying there. And many of these, many of these statements are actually picked up by Revelation 18 and, and expanded upon. Now, the restoration and regeneration of Israel we see in verses 17 to 20. Now, we shouldn't miss the connection here between the fall of Babylon and the rise of Israel, Israel's national regeneration. Now, this is, another re this is another reason here why this cannot be dealing with the Babylon of history. This, is this has to be dealing with the Babylon of future prophecy. Uh, and there's no reason not to take this as the modern Babylon on the modern day Euphrates in, in Iraq. Verse 17, we have a summary, of a summary description of Israel's sufferings. Israel is a hunted sheep. The lions have driven him away. First, the king of Assyria devoured him, and now at last, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has broken his bones. So we see Israel uh, being portrayed here as a hunted sheep. Uh, this is a summary description of Israel's sufferings. Israel, she's described as a flock here uh, that, uh, sorry, um, Israel is a hunted sheep. The lions have driven him away. First, the king of, I just read it, didn't I? Yes. <laughs> Seniors moment. So Israel is a hunted sheep. She's described as a flock that is scattered by lions. <clears throat> now, usually <clears throat> when lions are symbolically in scripture, they refer to various countries. Now, in this verse, the symbol here is in specific rep reference to two nations, uh, the nation of Assyria that, that brought down the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel, and then Babylon that brought down the southern kingdom of Judah. 
The king of Assyria devoured them because he brought down the northern kingdom uh, at last. Nebuchadnezzar now broke his bones because Babylon had brought down the southern kingdom of Judah. In verse 18, therefore, thus says Jehovah of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will punish the king of Babylon and his land as I have punished the king of Assyria. Now, it is now Babylon who must suffer punishment. Therefore, therefore, what's it there for? Because of what he did to the Jews, God will punish the king of Babylon and his land. Notice here it's the future tense. He says, I will punish. This is used in contrast to the past as God punished the king of Assyria. Now, between uh, 612 and 609 BC, the Assyrians were destroyed totally by the Babylonians. Nineveh was never a city again after the Babylonian destruction. What the Babylonians did to Assyria will someday be done to the Babylonians. Now, as for Israel, we see in verse 19, there will one day be a, a restoration of Israel. So in light of the, of the ruins of Babylon, Israel will be restored. And I will bring Israel again to his pasture. Israel will be returned to her own land or pasture. He shall feed on Carmel and Bashan. Now, Mount Carmel is in Galilee. Galilee will be part of the Jewish territory. Bashan is the present-day Golan Heights. That's also going to be part of Jewish territory. And it says his soul shall be satisfied upon the hills of Ephraim and in Gilead. Now, Ephraim is the central mountain, mountain range known today as the West Bank of the Jordan. The West Bank will also be part of Israel. Gilead is on the East Bank of the Jordan. Gilead will also be part of Israel. Now, Gilead is the very northern part of Jordan. It's north of ancient Amman. And the Ammonites are going to be a separate nation in the kingdom. However, north of them, the territory of Gilead will be part of, of the Jewish territory. So these verses here will only be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. So these statements of verse 19 will be fulfilled only in the millennial kingdom. Uh, when the millennial kingdom, we know, follows the tribulation. So it's only in the closing days of the tribulation that the prophecies concerning the destruction of the city of Babylon are going to be fulfilled. Now in verse 20, we have the regeneration. This time of Israel, this time, uh, the time here is carefully given. In those days and at that time, this is the same as what we saw back in verse 4. These two phrases, those days and at that time, refer to the time of Babylon's destruction, which will occur in the closing days of the Great Tribulation. It is during that time the iniquity of Israel will be sought for and there shall be none and the sins of Judah and they shall not be found for I will pardon them whom I leave as a remnant to hear at this future time uh, people will search for Israel's iniquity but you won't be able to find any they'll look for the sins of Judah there won't be any only when a nation or an individual is saved and regenerated can these statements be true now remember or you might not remember, but this is what happens. In conjunction with the campaign of Armageddon, while the fall of Babylon is the second stage, the national salvation and regeneration of Israel is the fifth stage of the campaign of Armageddon. During the campaign of Armageddon, Israel's sins will be totally forgiven. There will be a national regeneration of Israel, and indeed, they all shall come to the Lord, and therefore their sins will not be found. Their iniquity shall be none. The sins of Judah shall not be found. And the reason is that God will pardon those whom he will leave as a remnant. The sins of, of all Israel at that time will be forgiven. Now we see Babylon's hammer of power being destroyed in verses 21 to 28. First up in verses 21 to 2, we just look at the destruction of Babylon in general. Uh, this is not only Babylon, the city, but also uh, 
Babylonia in general will be destroyed. In verse 21, we see the call to destroy the land. Go up against the land of Merathame, even against it and against the inhabitants of Picard. Now, Merathame is a word which means double rebellion or double bitterness. Yeah, um, as far as we know right now, there was no actual city in Babylonia by that name. Merathame was a region of Mat Maritim in southern Babylon, where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers enters the Persian Gulf. It's likely here that Jeremiah used a play on words. Go up against a land of double rebellion. Another possible reading is go up to the land of the bitter rivers. Um, this, this, this rendering might make it uh, more sense simply because the ancient nation of Babylon is a land where the Tigris and Euphrates River actually meet the Persian Gulf. That, that, that could be one of, the, one, of the, one of the ways of looking at it. It also uh, refers to the inhabitants of Pecod. You know, as for the name Pecod, the Hebrew term comes from a root that means to attend to or to visit or to muster. Um, in light of this definition of Pecod, the enemy is to march against the people of visitation. And the visitation here would be one of punishment or judgment. Again, it's unlikely here that Jeremiah was using, a, it's, it's likely, sorry, that Jeremiah was using a word, another word play here. This one being quite sarcastic because uh, Peacock, Peacock referred to the to the Armenian tribe in southern Babylon on the east bank of the Tigris. So this this area of Peacock has to do with um, east the regions of eastern Babylonia. Then he applies what is called a Kerim curse. A Kerim curse. There it is in the bottom of that slide. There he tells them to slay and utterly destroy. The Hebrew word for utter destruction is kerem, C-H-E-R-E-M, or C-H-A-R-A-M, whichever way you look at it. This is a very extreme destruction. It means that once it is destroyed, it becomes totally untouchable. Now, remember Joshua coming into the land. Jericho was under the kerem judgment. Jericho was to be totally destroyed by Joshua, and no one was to touch anything of it. Now, there's a man called Achan. Now, he did touch something of it. In fact, he touched the Babylonian garment of all things. And the result was that the Jews lost the Battle of Ai. The Jews could not continue winning the war until Achan's sin was brought and until Achan and his own were completely destroyed. So, what was true of Jericho back then under Joshua is now true of Babylon. Babylon is to be totally and utterly destroyed. It becomes untouchable. The command is to do according to all that God has commanded. In verse 22, we see the reason for it. The reason is that a sound of battle is in the land and of great destruction. So by means of military conquest, Babylonia is going to be ruined. And in verse 23, he deals with the figure of the broken hammer. How has the hammer of the whole earth cut asunder and broken? How has Babylon become a desolation among the nations? The word how here is, is the word ach, A-C-H, and, it, and it's, it's, an, it's an exclamation of surprise. How can this happen, this mighty Babylon? Uh, we're going to see uh, more on this word when we get into the book of Lamentations. Uh, th this call here, it's a, it's, a, it's a call of shocking surprise. How is this possible? How can the hammer who controlled the whole earth be now broken and the phrase here the whole earth is used now why is it used well because according to isaiah 14 verses 5 to 6 or 4 to 6 and other passages babylon will conquer the entire world in the tribulation the antichrist will do it and he's going to set up his capital in the rebuilt city of babylon babylon will be the capital of the world which has been the hammer of the nations around the earth and that's going to be broken down. And so Babylon has become a desolation among, among the very nations which she once conquered. Now, I, I just uh, just Isaiah 14, uh, 4 to 6, if you read that, you'll see that uh, Isaiah tells the people to take up a parable against the king of Babylon and say, 
how has the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? So it, it's just a, it's a taunt against uh, Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 14, 46, that, um, that a new taunt song will be directed against the Antichrist, who during the tribulation will be the king of Babylon. Now, this statement here indicates that Babylon will become his political capital. Zechariah 5, Zechariah 5, 5 to 11, also describes uh, Babylon as the economic capital of the world. Uh, and since Babylon will be the capital of the entire world, the Antichrist will also be the king over all the earth. Now, in verse 24, he deals with the fact that Babylon will be entrapped. I have laid a snare for you, and you are also taken, O Babylon, and you were not aware. So the picture here is that Babylon will be trapped, entrapped. Those who come against Babylon will come suddenly and unexpectedly, and the attack against Babylon will take place suddenly. Before anyone knows what is happening, Babylon will burn away. You are found and also caught because you have striven against Jehovah. The reason God's going to do this is because Babylon is guilty of sins against the God of Israel. Verse 25, Jehovah has opened his armory and has brought forth the weapons of his indignation. For the Lord Jehovah of hosts has a work to do in the land of the Chaldeans. Now, Jeremiah talks about um, uh, uh, God's weaponry against Babylon. He's opened up his armory. And the picture here is that God has gone to his armory in heaven and opened the doors. He's allowed the soldiers to take what they need from the armory. And they're moving out. And he's brought forth the weapons of his indignation. Now, the term his indignation is a common term for the tribulation period. In the Old Testament, the tribulation is often referred to as a time of God's indignation. It is the period of God's indignation and this weaponry will show what his indig in indignation can do the lord of hosts has a work to do in the land of the chaldeans in isaiah 28 verse 21 one of the names of the great tribulation is jehovah's strange work this is another tribulation term expression in this passage along with the term indignation we have the expression the lord jehovah of hosts has a work to do in the land of the Chaldeans. Tribulation terms. And you have the expression, Jehovah's strange work is applied to Babylon specifically. This all implies it's going to be fulfilled in the great tribulation. Then verse 26. Come against her from the utmost border. Uh, verses 26 to 27. We'll just read these two. Come against her from the utmost border. Open her storehouses. Cast her up as heaps and destroy her utterly. Let nothing of her be left. Slay all her bullocks. Let them go down to the slaughter. Woe unto them for their day is come and the time of their visitation. So in these two verses, 26 and 27, God is seen as giving instructions to the enemies of Babylon. In verse 26 to the first part of 27, he issues a series of six commands. First, come against her from the utmost borders. No matter where you are, Move, come against Babylon. Second, open her storehouses, or as you capture sections of Babylonia, open the storehouses and scatter them on the ground. Get them away. Third, cast her up as heaps, or what, what he's saying is the cities you capture, destroy, so that they become nothing but archaeological mounds. Fourth, destroy her utterly, or do not allow anything to remain. Destroy all that you capture. Why? Because she's under the Kerem curse. Now, number five, let nothing of her be left. The word that Jeremiah uses means remnant. The word, this word is often used by Jeremiah and the other prophets in re reference to the surviving remnant of Israel. But while much of Israel will die, there will be a surviving remnant. Here with Babylon, while the Jews have a remnant remaining, the Babylonians will have nothing, absolutely nothing. Six, slay her bullocks. Let them go down to the slaughter. So that which belongs to the Babylonians, because it's part of the, the Kerem judgment, the, the total destruction judgment, it must be destroyed. The cattle also must be destroyed. And, and while they're permitted to open the storehouses, the bullocks also, along with everything in the storehouses, must also be destroyed. Now, the enemy is to take nothing 
as spoil, not even the animals. First, the second part of verse 27 ends with the reason. Woe to them for their day has come, the time of their visitation. This is a play upon words from the word pick from, from Peacod. Babylon is going to experience the visitation of her judgment, which is why the sixth commands have just been given in verses 26 to the first part of 27. 28. The voice of them that flee and escape out of the land of Babylon to declare in Zion the vengeance of Jehovah our God, the vengeance of his temple. So now we see on the, on the flip side, on the other hand, in verse 28, we see the flight of the Jews from Babylon once again. The voice of them that flee and escape out of the land. The word for escape here is the Hebrew word pallet, P-A-L-L-E-T, -L which has to do with fugitives or refugees. So the Jewish refugees will flee from Babylon. And those who flee from Babylon must flee to Zion. And Zion is Jerusalem. Now, as the Jews of Babylon flee, they make their way down to Jerusalem. The Babylonian Jewish refugees then tell the Jews of Jerusalem, the vengeance of, our, of Jehovah our God is accomplished, the vengeance of his temple. Now, in the context here, which temple are we talking about? Well, the context here, this temple refers to the tribulation temple. Three and a, remember, remember this. Well, I'll remind you of this. Three and a half years before this prophecy is fulfilled, in the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist will take over the Jewish temple. He sets himself in it and declares himself to be God. Later, he will set up his image in the Holy of Holies in the Jewish temple. And this image will remain in the Jewish temple. And while Babylon serves as the political and economic capital of the world, the Jerusalem temple will serve as the religious capital of the world in the worship of the Antichrist as God. Now, because of this act of blasphemy, God declared in verse 28 that he would take revenge. You know, this passage that deals with these things include Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, Daniel 9, 27, Matthew 24, verse 15, Matthew 24, 15, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, and Revelation 11, verses 1 to 2. All four passages here describe events that will occur in relation to the Jewish temple. In all of them, the events described will take place in the middle of the seven-year tribulation. The detail we noted here is that at the midpoint of the tribulation, the third temple is standing and has been functioning for at least a little while. Now, coming to our final section, we see the pride of Babylon is going to be humbled. And we see this in verses 29 to 32. In verse 29 is the instruction to the enemy. The instruction here is to call together the archers against Babylon, all them that bend the bow. So the first instruction to Babylon's enemies is to issue a call to the military forces to attack the city. He says, encamp against her round about, let none thereof escape, recompense her according to her work, according to all that she has done, do unto her. So second, they are to lay siege to Babylon. Third, not one person is to escape. Fourth, the enemy is to pay Babylon back for her actions and to do to her as she has done to others. Second part of verse 29 spells out the reason for these instructions. For she has been proud against Jehovah, against the Holy One of Israel. The Babylon of the future will boast superiority over the God of Israel. And for this deed, she must be destroyed. In verse 30, we have the results of the judgment. Therefore shall her young men fall in her streets, and all her men of war shall be brought to silence in that day, says Jehovah. The term therefore indicates that Babylon's warriors, both young and old, will fall because of the city's pride against the God of Israel. Jeremiah once again used the phrase, in that day, to indicate again that this event would occur in the prophetic future. Babylon will fall in that day, meaning in the great tribulation day, and the city will be silenced with the silence of death. In verse 31, God makes a declaration here. Behold, 
I am against you, O you proud one, saith the Lord, Jehovah of hosts, for your day is come, the time that I will visit you. Hebrew term here for proud one, Zadon means Z A D O N. It is Z A D O N means insolence and presumptuousness, and is used here as a, a personification. Babylon is insolence personified. Therefore, Jehovah declared that He would attend to her with a visitation of judgment. When that visitation of judgment has run its course, the result in verse thirty-two will be the destruction of Babylon's pride. The proud one shall stumble and fall, and none shall raise him up. And I will kindle a fire in his cities, and it shall devour all that are round about him. So in the stumbling and falling of Babylon, God promised to kindle a fire throughout the cities of Babylonia. He's going to devour all who are around him. That's, 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 that's Babylon. Because God uses the term proud one and him in the verse, in the sense of an individual person, this is clearly referring to the specific proud king of Babylon who will be the Antichrist. His pride against God is seen in his own self-declaration of deity in the Jewish temple itself, which you see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 to 4. Uh, it says here, He that opposes and exalts himself against all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits in the temple of God, setting himself forth as God. That's the Antichrist. We'll finish it. Here we go. Jehovah is Israel's redeemer. We see in verses 33 and 34. Again, so we see Babylon's demise is now contrasted in verses 33 to 34 with Israel's redemption. So with the fall of Babylon, we have the rise of Israel. Verse 33 first deals with the, with the past oppression of Israel. Thus says Jehovah of hosts, the children of Israel and the children of Judah are oppressed together. And all, all that took them captive hold them fast. They refuse to let them go. So this general description could only apply to the oppression Israel experienced in Egypt, under Assyria, or in Babylon. In all of these cases, God it took God's intervention to redeem the people. Plagues in Egypt, uh, Babylon, were on the Nebuchadnezzar, ended Assyria's, Assyria's oppression, and then Cyrus, king of Persia, released the Jews from captivity in Babylon. Now, according to verse 34, it will also be Jehovah who will end Israel's oppression during the tribulation. Their Redeemer, this is verse 34, their Redeemer is strong. Jehovah of hosts is his name. He will thoroughly plead their cause that he may give rest to the earth and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. So in verse 34, the oppression of Israel will give way to the redemption of Israel. Their Redeemer is strong. Jehovah of hosts is his name. The name Jehovah emphasizes God as a covenant keeper. And based on the Abrahamic covenant, God's name required him to redeem Israel from Egypt in the days of the Exodus. By the same token, because his name is Jehovah, because he's a covenant keeping God, it is for that reason he will redeem Israel from the forces of the Antichrist. As the nation's mighty defender, he will plead Israel's cause. There's a play in words here. The Hebrew term for plead is riv, R-I-V, meaning to strive or to contend. And the Hebrew term for cause is also riv, which is, which is the noun form of this word and means strife and dispute. So Jehovah promised here to vigorously dispute Israel's dispute or strive against Israel's strife. Uh, that's the plain words. Now, further on. On the day of Babylon's judgment, he will bring rest to the earth, but turmoil to the inhabitants of the city. There's another subtle wordplay here in the Hebrew term for give rest is raga, R-A-G-A, -A, and the term for disquiet is ragaz, R-A-G-A-Z. Again, Jeremiah is a student in some word plays here. Jehovah promised that Israel would experience one meaning of the Hebrew word, which would have been rest, while Babylon would suffer the other meaning of that word, which is disquiet. And that is where we leave the session for this week. Thank you for coming along.
study hard, grow strong.